The guest on this episode of Theme Park Thursday with Dillo's Diz is Johnny Tamaro, who can now be seen in the world premiere of The Wanderer, the new Broadway-aimed musical based on the life of rock and roll Hall of Famer Dion, now playing through April 24th at the Paper Mill Playhouse, papermill.org for tickets, both as a lead singer of Dion and the Belmonts and then as a solo artist, Dion was one of the most popular American rock and roll performers of his time. 30 top 40 hits, including Run Around Sue, Teenager in Love, I Wonder Why, and The Wanderer. See the real life musical The Wanderer at the Paper Mill Playhouse now through April 24th, 2022, papermill.org. And now on with the show. And now, the top-rated and most listened-to sibling podcast about theme parks that drops on a Thursday from the state of New York, Theme Park Thursday with Dillo's Diz, brought to you by Dillo'sDizResort.com. Now is the time... Forever? Old. A minute and a half. Hashtag... Always MGM. Old, old, old. The secret staircase. We always do that. You are approaching the unloading area. Behold the majesty of the Sistine Seal. For the kids. A salute to all theme parks, but mostly Walt Disney. Ha! What a cute ending. Aloha and welcome aboard. This is Theme Park Thursday with Dillo's Diz. She is Jen. Hello. And I am Frank, and I am excited because this is an hour of getting swept up in New York City nostalgia. I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm so excited. I'm going to jump right in because this guest, I feel like he has touched so many parts of New York City icons. Mm -hmm. He's had iconic moments in New York City. And now... Opening officially this Sunday at the Paper Mill Playhouse, which they say next stop Broadway after that. Yes. He's got his fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. crossed. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest this week on Theme Park Thursday is the one, the only, Johnny Tamaro. Johnny, what is up? Oh, what is up? What is not up, Frank? It's crazy. <laughs> <clears throat> this, 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 this past couple of months have been uh, a whirlwind of overwhelming emotions and just amazing stuff. You know, I started out with this project in 2011. Wow. Mm-hmm. The yeah. writer called me up and said, guess what? And he did, and usually doesn't call. He just, he's a texter. Uh-huh. So he <laughs> called me. I thought something was wrong. So I thought, <laughs> okay. He said, uh, I just had lunch with Dion. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to write a musical about his life and you're going to play his dad. And I went, uh, okay. <laughs> and reading after reading after reading and then the workshop and now we're here at paper mill and the buzz is 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 a loud buzz it's so <laughs> buzzing it's crazy people are just like i have to come back i have to come back i have to be my husband i gotta be my wife i mean when i go see a broadway show i go i see it it's great mm-hmm. i don't say immediately i have to come back and see it so yeah. there's something going on i don't know what it is but we're very hopeful for the i future. think it's you i think it's you mm-hmm. The project, of course, is The Wanderer. It's the musical based on the life of Dion. The author, who you've had a long time relationship with, is Charles Messina. Um, So just to, you know, just to kind of put the historical timeline, which you started with 2011 there, it was going to open at Paper Mill uh, in May of 2020, I think. Is that correct? Or at least it was going to have a run in May of 2020. It was going to open at Paper Mill in, in 2020, May 28th to June 28th. And uh, I got my offer email on March 6th. Mm-hmm. And I was very excited. We were going to start rehearsals on April 20th. And mm-hmm. I said, oh, my God, I can't believe this this year. It was amazing. And then a week later, they closed Broadway. And I said to my friend Miles at work, Miles, they just closed Broadway. He goes, when's your show? I said, 28th to June 28th. And he said, and this is an ongoing joke we have. Together. He goes, you should be fine. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And he you know, so we weren't fine. But, you know, um, we didn't get canceled, which is good. Yeah. We got postponed to 21. And then we got postponed again until now. And knock on wood, you know, um, the whole company and – the people involved at Paper Mill and, and the producers for The Wanderer have done their due diligence to make sure that we are following every protocol and we are doing things the safe way. And we have not had anybody, you know, test positive and mm-hmm. 
but we, you know, we mask up, we, everything, everything, everything we, we have to do to get it done. And yeah, we're hoping that everything stays the same. And I think it will because we're doing the right things. Yeah, that's good. And I think, you know, especially that you've waited this long, no one's gonna, no one's gonna take any chances on anything, you know? No, yeah, no. no. no, 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 no. Yeah. When it, you got that call 11 years ago, what have you, just start start with uh, the workshopping process, like how, <laughs> when did you, when did you get little bits and pieces along the way? And then when it led up to maybe the first reading? That 2011, he called me, said, we have it there. I'm going to write it with him. Uh, and um, we're going to do a reading uh, in October sometime. I said, okay. And October, I think it was 13th at the Triad up on 72nd and Broadway. Mm -hmm. We did uh, a reading and it was, it was a chunky play. Wait, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> he's getting, he's got, he's got visuals. I love it. Nice. Yeah, so I have the first script here signed by Dion. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It. That's awesome. Well, that's I'll, never cool. get, I'll never get rid of this. And the <laughs> script is, is very different than what it is now. Um, mm -hmm. There was, a, oh, I, my shirt. <laughs> awesome. um, the shirt is very different. The shirt, the, the, the script is very different than it is now. Um, it was a bunch of different characters, and uh, there was uh, there were two, there were gangsters, and there were two record producers, and uh, the stuff like that. And then we did the reading. It was great. The reading was great. Dion was there. His wife was there. It was wonderful, and nothing happened. And I, you know, and Charles and I are very good friends. So we right. are working on other projects. And we're working on other projects. It's like, what's going on with the Wanderer? He goes, mm -hmm. I don't know. The, Dion's manager is like, it's a lot of work. It's too much. We're touring. He's still doing shows. It's, mm -hmm. it's like too much money, too much work. That goes down 2012, 13, 14, 15. Wow. 2016, somebody that was at the reading at the triad now runs the theater at Malloy College in Long Island, mm -hmm. Madison mm -hmm. Theater. And he says, I'm, I'm doing a reading series, and I would love The Wanderer to open the reading series. Um, I'll pay all the actors. We'll have a band. There'll be food. You know, once I hear food, I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to open the reading series. So we did. I mean, the characters were great. Everybody that played. Robert Cuccioli, wonderful Broadway actor, yeah. was uh, in, the, in it with us, and it was great. And we did this reading, and it, it was great. People loved it. And in the audience was this woman, Jill Menza. And Jill and Charles have a mutual friend. And she said, what's going on with this? And he said, nothing. <laughs> and we have a meeting. And he said, okay. And they had a meeting. And from that meeting, everything just started to go. Mm -hmm. So I got the piece of paper in the email that said The Wanderer LLC. And it said the, the series of events, the 29-hour reading. <laughs> The 60 hour reading. Now, the 29 hour reading means yeah. from the moment we start rehearsal to the moment the, the reading ends, equity, the union only gives you 29 hours to do that. Mm -hmm. And that cost this much uh, amount. Mm -hmm. And then the 60 hour reading cost this much. And then after the 60 hour reading was the workshop. And then after the workshop was the regional. <laughs> and after the regional is Broadway. And it shows all the money of, of what it costs. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? So, I look at the paper now and I see we've done everything mm -hmm. except for the bottom one. Yeah. <laughs> which costs about, you know, 10 to $12 million. Sure. But we're very confident that the, the right people are going to see this at Paper Mill and they're yeah. going to be like, take it out their checkbooks and say, who do I make the check out to? Yeah. Because this show, as Dion says, this show cannot be denied. You know, it's. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a story of redemption. It's a story of perseverance. It's a story of knowing in the cockles of your soul what you're supposed to be doing with mm -hmm. your life and pushing forward. And not, it's not like not letting people tell you what to do. It is that, but it's more that, um, trust me, I know what I, I have to do. I know what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And getting the people involved with your life who are telling you, no, 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 you have to do this. Getting them to understand, listen to me. I, this is what I need to do and, and, and be on board with me. And that's the beautiful roller coaster of the show. And the arc is so perfect. It, it, it's just so overwhelming to watch. It's like my baby. 
<laughs> just crawling and then walking and then eating. Mm -hmm. It's so crazy to watch it happen. And um, yeah, that's how it went, all went down. And, you know, usually it, it does take this long for a, a show to get off its feet. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but to watch it all happen and, and be the, by, the, the, the person, the bystander, because I'm the only one, the only cast member from the very, very beginning. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And it's like my baby. Like I said, I watch it happen. I was like, what the heck is going on here? How did we, how did we get here? It's mm -hmm. amazing. And the set that we have is designed by Beowulf Borat, a uh, Tony oh, okay. set designer. And the sound is designed by John Shivers, Tony winning sound designer. I mean, it's crazy. Lighting <laughs> costumes. We feel like we're in a movie with these costumes. Yeah. We feel like, and it's oh, the and the show is is very cinematic. It's it's done like a movie. And, mm -hmm. um, it's so humbling, and, and and I'm so proud to be a part of it. It's, it's very amazing. Jen will be annoyed with me when I tell her that usually uh, for things to really like reach the next level, it takes 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> she gets very when, – when we talk about this podcast, I'm like, 10 years, just so you know. <laughs> 10 years for the next level. And she's like, shut up. But, uh, <laughs> but I love but, what you guys talk about. You guys talk about great stuff. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know who was at the show the other night? Who's that? Kimmy Gibbler. Stop it. <laughs> we were just I hanging mean, out with her, you know, a couple of weeks ago. I know. Andy's She's gone. A Joey McIntyre fan. Mm -hmm. And everything Joey does, and she could not stop saying enough about the show. Yeah. Uh, I didn't get a chance to meet her because I had family there, and we have a lot of COVID protocols. There's no yeah. safe scoring. We have to barricade the back because we have a lot of blockheads coming to see this show. Because mm -hmm. of the block fans, as they call them. And <laughs> Now, Jen, block it, man. <laughs> I told Joey when I first met him, I said, Joe, I had an acid wash denim jacket, and I had all the new kids' pins on my jacket. And unfortunately, nice. I apologize, but Donnie's was a little bigger than yours. <laughs> he goes, and it was like, it was like this big. Remember those big buttons? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I and, had and a Joey just, one. Yes. Yeah, I remember. Exactly. <laughs> and Joey said, you actually wore that? I, was, yeah, I wanted to be you guys. You had my job. I was jealous. But he's great. He's great in the show. He's a, he's yeah. a wonderful person. It's just everybody in the show is just cast correctly, and it really is. Uh, it's phenomenal. It's it's uh, yeah. it's and we're doing it's groundbreaking because it's a hybrid. Mm -hmm. It's a play that has music. And it's also a rock and roll show, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. I know I know Charles Messina like mostly was play based, so that, that's what's been in intriguing to me is that he's usually you know writing these full length plays, but yeah. to see him take kind of take on this format uh, and be involved with that—that's that, exactly. that first, yeah. first time Broadway musical writer, first mm -hmm. time producer on um, this magnitude. I mean, it's 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 stunning. It's so so, so and it's visual. It's beautiful. It's it's just I can't stop saying enough about it because how proud I am of it. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's so great. It's it, people are going and nuts. I love to hear like how all the behind the scenes. Like I, you know, I've read um I can't remember the name of the book, uh about how a chorus line was made. And I will watch, you know, documentaries about kind of the behind the scenes of how shows get on their feet. And I love those stories. But yours you know, you throw in a pandemic in the mix. It, it, it's it's like, it's amazing, though, that still with that, you're still here. You guys work through it all. And to your point about the show itself, about perseverance, I mean, the, the show itself is, is yes. The show itself, yes. it's like, what? It's, yeah. It's, yeah, I say that all the time. Look yeah. at us. The same thing he does, he does in the show. It's mm -hmm. not yeah, nuts, I mean, and, and speaking about the protocols, like my mother went to see Sebastian Maniscalco at the Prudential Center. Yeah, uh, right. 19,000 people, mm -hmm. no masks. Yeah. They weren't checking vaccine cards. Yeah. But what we're doing because of equity, we're still doing that. Mm -hmm. And we're yeah. still masking up. The whole audience is masked up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thank goodness we're still with it. But, you know, who, that may change. It may not change. Who knows? We'll see how yeah. it goes. Um, yeah. Well, and you're seeing a very, this is, you know, since Broadway reopened in September, you're seeing kind of, I feel like, you know, Broadway is still trying to figure it out. So yeah. what kind of, and I don't think 
people know what kind of shows are going to hit, what's going to stay, how long things right. are going to last. Right. So, so when you talk about these themes and you talk about, you know, what's underneath, uh, you know, in, in Dion's life and everything else, like, you know, no, this is a, this is a show. This is the show you need on Broadway right now. This is what mm -hmm. we need. I mean, we're recording this the morning after the Oscars. So right. everyone is everyone's in a confused place. But, yes. but, yes. but you feel like you need this kind of story. You do. You do. <laughs> and the producers know that, too. The producers of what they're doing is unprecedented. Mm -hmm. They spent a lot of money to mm -hmm. take this show, put it on paper mill stage, and then what they can do is they put it in a box with a ribbon and a bow, they go to Broadway and they say, here, <laughs> they're ready. What, where are we going? Mm -hmm. So they're very confident. Everybody's confident. I mean, you know, this, this is, they gotta get this. Yeah. I think it's gonna be, um, a little bit easier to get this because like you said frank we need a show like this for people to come see it and be like oh I'm, like i said the arc and the yeah. way the show goes from mm -hmm. the first moment until the end i mean chills crying warmth amazement oh my god i can't I'm so happy for him you know mm -hmm. and he's eight, he's gonna be 83 in J july and he wow. he actually he called me last night and left me a voicemail. <laughs> and it was, sure. uh, it was crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Was, <laughs> at one point during the show, uh, Dion comes home and uh, we have a, like a, like an intervention, which didn't exist in the 50s, but that's mm -hmm. what we call it, the intervention scene. We have a conversation. Uh, myself, Jolie Trebuzio, who plays my wife, who's played my wife, in many things, she's played my sister. A, a bunch of we worked together a very long time. And he leaves and slams the door. And when he slammed the door, the door popped back open. So Dion left me a voicemail yesterday about this is what it was. He goes, Johnny tomorrow. <laughs> Yo, this it's me. Listen, if the door pops open, close the door. <laughs> It's your house. <laughs> Even put a chair underneath it. Just close the. Oh my God! I am never erasing it <laughs> forever. And he's just that type of guy. He's just. Mm -hmm. He's very real. He's yeah. very, um, you know, no nonsense. You know, he'll tell you like it is, how it is, and mm -hmm. he has a lot of um, input into the show, which is great. Yeah. To pull me aside and go, my father didn't like. Yeah, he, he had very good qualities, but he didn't like to work. Mm -hmm. So I put that into my, you know, into my yeah. psyche. It's okay, how do I, you know, so um, he's great. He's great. That's awesome. And just the, I mean, Dion's music history is like legendary and, you know, run around Sue, you know, I wonder why. What, uh, teenager in love, what would you, uh, two sided question, I guess, um, in terms of, your knowledge of Dion's music. Is there a song that's not one of the big ones? I'd be like, this, I love this song. This is, this song is, you know, m one of my favorites that maybe people don't know. And I, maybe it's the same answer. I don't know, but something that's in the show that you're like, wait till you see this musical number. So, so it, that's a good question because there's a lot of songs in the show that are not hits. Mm -hmm. And that's a thing that the producers and the writer really wanted to uh, bring across. You know, we could, I mean, you know, run around Sue. I wonder yeah. why. The mm -hmm. They're the in the show. Yeah. They're in the show, of course, the wonder. Yeah. <laughs> a, a song like Sweet Surrender, hmm. that's one of my favorite songs. Mm -hmm. And that moment in the show, I'm, I'm getting, you know, I'm not just a performer. I'm not just an actor and a singer, but I'm a, a theater geek and a theater fan. Mm -hmm. When I see something and I know it works, it just fills me with joy. And on top of it, I'm in it mm -hmm. too. Right. So the sweet surrender moment is amazing. And that song is 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 beautiful. And then another song that's great is a song that Susan, Dion's wife, sings in the show that Dion wrote specifically for this show. Mm -hmm. And that's another beautiful song. It's called The You I Know. And then another song, I'm sorry, another yeah, song that I like yeah. is, <laughs> is what I'm looking for. <laughs> the vows, when they do the vows at the wedding mm -hmm. and the song they sing together, uh, Dion had to make a phone call to one of his um, one of his friends, uh, what the heck is his name? Um, 
Bruce Springsteen. Oh, uh, I'm and, not familiar. He's a little <laughs> familiar. And he said, can we use this song? And Bruce said, yeah, of course. Uh -huh. So it's like, <laughs> so that's a beautiful song too. A, a funny thing about the song that I get to sing in the show, it's called The Majestic. And the ironic thing about the song I sing is it was on the A side on the 45 mm. and on the b side was the wanderer oh, on the b side oh wow yes because the, the producers wanted this majestic song to be the next song that the next dance craze that sweeps the nation but the wanderer that took off wow so um yeah the, the, i'm sorry that's a long answer sweet surrender and the song that uh that susan sings are two of my favorite songs yeah just uh, just as a, a sidebar here, uh, when I a stage manage a show in at UCF in Orlando called uh, "Run for Your Wife," which is a farce by Ray Cooney with uh, the guys married to two different women, the the curtain call we staged to the Wanderer, and so everyone came out at different parts of uh, of the lyrics and oh, cool. uh, favorite part of the show every day. <laughs> it was so cool. So at Paper Mill from official opening. Right, we had previews this weekend. You're opening on Sunday, and then through April 24th, I have that date April right. 24th, and yeah. uh, possibly extend to May 1st. Yes. Mm -hmm. We're looking at that right now. They're uh, looking at uh, see what is that an R2D2 mug? <laughs> it is an R2D2 <laughs> mug. <laughs> yeah, probably extend till May 1st, but we'll see how that goes. We'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, and Dion, it, it's like you know, it's one of those classic New York stories. It's it, it, mm -hmm. it, it, it just fits if it's Broadway. And Johnny, you are a classic New York story. So now I want to talk about you for a little bit. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Here's the thing, Johnny. We're friends on Facebook, right? We, yeah. we go way back. Yeah. And your Facebook post I love because you like mark time. And I'm like, he's the most nostalgic person I know because every year I know what's coming up every year. Something Here's this date. I love it. Tell me about growing up. Just tell me how how did you become so nostalgic? I think that's oh where we should gosh. start. Oh, my God. <laughs> so growing up in Brooklyn. I'm about to t realize how I became it. <laughs> happening I'm, in real oh time. <laughs> Growing up in Brooklyn in the house my great grandfather bought in 1930. What? <laughs> for like, I don't know, $4,500. Like, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. A two family house with a basement and a backyard. Okay. In Gravesend, Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. It was my grandmother lived upstairs. You're going to make me get emotional, Frank. Yes. My grandmother lived upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> My grandmother lived upstairs. We lived downstairs, and we had the basement. But there were no locked doors. Yeah. So until I was a teenager, I thought I lived in a three-story house. Because <laughs> we had run of the middle of the whole place. It was one room. We had two bedroom on the bottom floor. My mother and father slept in the front, and my brothers and I, two brothers, I had two brothers, three of us slept in the back room. So five people, one bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of showers upstairs in grandma's house. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, get ready. What are you doing? <laughs> um, we, uh, and we grew up like that. And then, uh, and my, my mother's parents lived a half a block away. We lived on West 8th between Bay Parkway and Avenue O. They lived on West 8th between Avenue O and Avenue P. Mm -hmm. and, my, and my mother's sister lived downstairs from my, my grandparents in that house. Mm -hmm. So our families were very, very close yeah. in proximity and, of course, close in, in, in heart and whatever. Mm -hmm. So we were always there. They were always there. We were always back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and every holiday, it was either there or be by me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every Christmas we would, I, I'd watch my grandfather, you know, get emotional. And I'm like, why is he crying? <laughs> crying? And every New Year's Eve, I'd see him get emotional. And he, I'd be like, why is he crying? <laughs> so I got old enough to realize, like, oh, he's crying because not only has another year passed, but he's thinking about people that are not here anymore. Mm -hmm. and about Christmases and New Year's from years past. And I went, oh. And then when I once I realized that, then I started crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I was 19, 
uh, my father, unfortunately, uh, unexpectedly passed away of a massive heart attack. Mm -hmm. So 19, 16 and 13 mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, devastated. You know, we were like, what? That doesn't happen to people like us. It doesn't mm -hmm. happen to other people. And um, my brothers and I, you know, my mom was 41. You know, so if you think, if I, when I think back to that moment, I'm like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she uh, she took over, man. And she was like, okay, I got to have three teenage boys that I have to bring to the next level of their lives into this right. world and get them ready and prepared. And anyway, it was, uh, it was rough, but, uh, she did what she had to do. And, um, you know, my baby brother is very, uh, uh, successful in his, uh, in his job. My, my middle brother is successful. Um, I'm, you know, I'm like the black sheep of the family. You know, <laughs> I, I have, I, you know, people ask me what I do for a living. I said, I'm a juggler. <laughs> I juggle regular work. I juggle performing. I juggle my family. I juggle everything. And I just, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I never, you know, I haven't dropped anything yet. So that's good. Yeah. Uh, but to, 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 to talk about the nostalgic point, it's, I love reminiscing. I love being in the moment, but also realizing I got here and I'm doing this because of, of like when when we had to sell that house I was talking about in mm -hmm. January of 20 I the next we closed and the next day I went to Queens to the cemetery to my great grandfather's mausoleum and I and I put my hand and I thanked him for giving our family 90 years of a, a wonderful house and and a, and, a, and, a, and wonderful memories I mean, that's how crazy nostalgic I am. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's, and my wife was with me, and, and even though she thinks, <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Beat that. Um, it was <laughs> crazy. Uh, she went with me, and yeah. she, you know, she held me. And, you know, it's something that I had, I thought I had to do, mm -hmm. you know, Carmine Palmento, you know, he, he, he took all of whatever money he had from being a tailor in the garment district in Manhattan and he plopped down and he, and he bought this house mm -hmm. and we were able to, you know, have all these great memories and live in this house for 90, you know, all these years. And yeah. my grandmother was brought up there. My father was brought up there. We were brought up there. My brother was bringing up his kids there. And it's just, it's just, uh, so yeah, that's what the, that's how nostalgic. That's where the nostalgia comes from. I believe is is my great grandfather started it by buying that house to 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 have a, a wonderful life for all of us for ninety years. All right, I'm not gonna try to make you emotional anymore. There, <laughs> 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 it's, it's and it a lot of stuff. We like to say we're so emotional that we're unemotional. So we just we do this a lot. Oh. Just push it all down, but at at a drop of a hat, I'll start crying. I had to cry commercials. Forget yeah. it. It's crazy. Listen, we wow. were we're gonna talk about how you made me cry. Maybe a little later. We're not there yet. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. So oh. get ready for that. Okay? Okay. I don't know if I know. I don't know if I know this. Time, so <laughs> never met you, Jen. <laughs> Very confused. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as the black sheep of your family, let's talk about some of some of the some of the great things that you've hit that are so New York City. You know, it, it's it's astounding. <laughs> Tony and Tina's wedding. Yes. Bef before there was the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser in Walt <laughs> Disney World and this immersive experience, mm -hmm. there was Tony and Tina's wedding, and you were a key part of that. So I want yes. to walk you through that. Yes. Um. In 1998, I. Uh, because of my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, she was like, you know, you do this community theater stuff. Um, you ever think about going to Manhattan and auditioning in Manhattan to get paid? I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm, okay, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm doing my community theater. I'm great. She was like, no, no, no. You, you, she goes, there's something that you have that a, a lot of the people in the community theater don't have. I said, okay. So we, uh, she goes, what do you need? I said, I need a resume. I need headshots. So she, for my birthday, got me headshot. We put a resume together. I started sending my stuff in. I got a phone call. The Kenny Rogers Christmas show at the Beacon Theater. 
-hmm. It's going to rival the, the Rockefeller Christmas Spectacular and the Christmas show at Madison Square Garden. And I auditioned, and six, callback late, six callbacks later, the last one being for Kenny Rogers himself. <laughs> now, that's crazy in itself because <laughs> growing up, we would go to the Catskills for our vacation for the week. Mm -hmm. And my father's Oldsmobile, and it had an eight-track player. And in the eight-track player, there were three eight-track tapes in the car. Barry Manilow's Greatest Hits. Yes. The <laughs> GM compilation, the General Motors compilation uh -huh. that came with the car. <laughs> and Kenny Rogers' Greatest Hits. Nice. And here I am. I'm, I'm performing. I'm, I'm auditioning for Kenny Rogers. I'm like, this is nuts. So I get cast in that. The director of that is the director and one of the original writers of Tony and Tina's Wedding. Mm -hmm. So we do the Kenny Rogers Christmas show. It's amazing. Side story, the guy I understudied, the day of previews, an hour before previews begin, goes to the director and says, I don't feel well. And he has the chicken pox. <gasps> no. We have not had the put-in rehearsal yet for the understudy. Oh, no. So the dance captain and the musical director take me into a room and we go, you're going to do this, 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 you're going to sing the song. And I'm like, and it went in. And I was Bruno the teddy bear, which was a great part. I loved it. <laughs> and for the whole week of previews, I went on. Mm -hmm. And that I think that's one of the reasons why the director called me on Christmas Eve and said, what are you doing? January 3rd to March 25th of 99. I said, nothing, because I quit my job to do the Kenny Rogers show. Mm -hmm. so nothing. He says, I'm going to send you on the national tour of Tony and Tina's wedding. You'll be part of the wait staff for the catering team, and you'll watch the show. You'll understudy um, four of the male roles. Wow. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> So Christmas Eve, I went upstairs and I told my family that I was doing this and everybody was excited and ecstatic. And I went to Houston, Texas on January 3rd and I watched the show for two months <clears throat> and I understudied uh, two, three of the groomsmen. I understudied Tina's ex-boyfriend uh, and that was it. I didn't understudy Tony. I didn't understudy anybody else. When I came back into New York, two weeks later, the director calls me up and he says, uh, how you been? Good. And every time he calls me, he would say, here's the thing. So he goes, here's the thing. Uh, the whole cast in the New York company is going to Fort Myers, Florida, the last week of April, first week of May. I don't have anybody to play Tony. I said, okay. He said, do um, you want to come in and play Tony for those two weekends? I said, I didn't understudy Tony on the tour. I don't. He goes, don't worry about it. You'll get it. You'll come in a week before. You'll watch the show, and you'll be fine. And I'm like, Okay. He knew I was a quick learner, a quick study. Mm -hmm. What happened with Bruno? I think that's what I think that's how when we have never had this conversation. But <laughs> as a matter of fact, he came to the Wanderer, the first performance from Oregon where he lives. He flew in. Oh my gosh, wow. wow. That blew my mind. So <laughs> I was amazed. Um, yeah. so we go, we I do the two weekends of Tony, and then he says that the, the second national tour is going out from October to May of ninety-nine to two thousand. Uh Every actor wants to hear this question. <laughs> Who do you want to play? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, yeah. oh. I was like, what? <laughs> so he goes, <clears throat> Who do you want to play? I said, I said, I always want to be a rock and roll star. Mm -hmm. So I want to play Donnie Dolce, who's the singer in the wedding band. I want to mm -hmm. be that character. He goes, mm -hmm. You got it. I'm like, Oh, oh that's going to be great. I'm going to sing every night. It'd be great. So that goes, uh, that's May, June, July. July, he calls me. He says, We're having auditions in August. I want you to be the behind the table with me and audition the girls. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So I would be the reader for the girls. Mm -hmm. And this went on for a week. And a week later, we're in a room with three girls who two of them were going to be bridesmaids. One of them was going to be Tina. I knew which one was going to be Tina, but they didn't know. So we did another <laughs> round of auditions just to make sure to lock it in, to be mm -hmm. solid, sure that this was happening. And... I was, and then he says to, to the girls, which I was like, what, what the hell is going on? He goes, girls, um, I don't know if you met Johnny Tamau yet. He'll be playing Tony on the tour. <laughs> and I go, 
in my mind, I'm like, what? <laughs> what? so we finished the audition and then I get to tell the girl playing Tina, her name was, uh, her name is Dina Rizzo. So I said, can I tell her? He goes, yeah. I said, so I wanted to tell him we had a moment. Okay. Oh my God. I can't believe it. Then they leave. We're walking to the train. I'm like, Larry, I'm playing Donnie Dolce on the tour. He goes, no, you're not. John. <laughs> you're going to, you're going to be my Tony and it's going to be wonderful. And I started crying, and he started, <laughs> I mean, me cry. And I started, crying. <laughs> and it was it was a wonderful moment. And uh, we went on the tour for a year, and television, and radio, and newspapers, and you know, talk about nostalgic. I have a box full of all <laughs> the things I was on and in, and recording and stuff like that. It was great. And then we did that for a year. We came off the tour a month later. We went to Japan for four weeks. Tokyo and Fukuoka, and we oh, did wow. the show in Japan. Oh my goodness! What? <laughs> they told us, oh, "Listen, um, the Japanese people are very reserved. They'll be sitting down. They probably won't get up like you know the regular New York show. So mm -hmm. be prepared to mingle while they're sitting." What? <laughs> they were up. Everybody was up. They were in it. They were ecstatic. They were oh loving it, loving it, loving it, loving it. That's awesome. And then we came back, and he just plopped me right into the show. As Donnie Dolce. <laughs> and I was Donnie Dolce from 2001 until 2010. Wow. And still able to go in for anybody because yeah. I knew the whole show and I understudied. I wasn't listed as the understudy. Oh, I was as uh, understudy for Vinnie Black, who's the caterer, which is a great part. And as I got older, I... I got listed as the understudy for Tony's father. <laughs> <laughs> but that was more towards 2010. Um, we had to put a little gray in the hair. Uh, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. I hold those years very close to me. I learned so much and kept learning every year and every show. The improv part of it is so uh, difficult sometimes because you got to you got to be right there, thinking right there on your feet. And I learned a lot from Tony and Tina's yeah. wedding. They were, uh, the whole thing was uh, amazing. You know, the, the, the way we rehearsed was um, we would talk about backstories. And we'd mm -hmm. talk about what happened. How did you guys get engaged? What happened mm -hmm. at the bachelor party? Went up to the bachelorette party. What happened at Tina's father's funeral? Um what happened at the strip club, like all this stuff. And we would know all these stories. So in the show, if somebody, if a cast member is talking to an audience member and the best was when the audience member would bring it up mm -hmm. because the audience member gets so confused at what's <laughs> happening. Because I remember this one time, the audience member says to Dominic, one of the groomsmen, how did Tony and Tina get engaged? And Dominic started telling the story. They were in Coney Island, and Tony loves Coney Island because he likes the hot dogs at Nathan's, and he <laughs> to walk around and play the games. And then he he paid the guy a, a tip to go to the, to get stuck at the top of the Wonder Wheel. How much did he pay him? And he sees me across the room, and he goes, Tony! And I go, what? He goes, how much did you pay that guy to go to the Wonder Wheel at the top to get engaged? I go, $20! And the guy at the table is like, how is this what we're talking about? <laughs> Confused the crap out of people. <laughs> that part about it was so good because we were able to be in the moment all the time. Yeah. It was it was it was fascinating. Um yeah, that those those years are uh are so close to me. Um yeah, Tony Tini's wedding was great to be involved in. And you know, before I did Tony and Tina's Wedding, I was I was doing these um, regular type of shows like Tony and Tina's Wedding. Yeah. It was Joey and Mary's Irish uh, Irish comedy. I was comedy. In that no, I was <laughs> Italian comedy wedding. Yeah. There was uh, where it was an Italian guy and an Irish girl. Mm -hmm. There was the Godfather's Meshugana wedding, <laughs> where the Godfather's daughter gets married to the Jewish boy. And my last show as in the Godfather's Meshugana wedding, my last show as uh, the bride's bodyguard, whose name was, I apologize, Sal Manella. <laughs> <clears throat> My last show, I'm sitting eating dinner before the show starts, and the guy, Frank Bonsangue, 
who uh, played the Godfather, he comes over to me. He goes, oh, Johnny, uh, this is a girl playing Angela tonight. It's her first night. And I look up and there's this beautiful 18 year old <laughs> Italian girl. And I was thrown for a second. I was like, oh, and she goes, how you doing? My name is Jolie. And I'm like, oh my God, this girl has a thicker accent than me. <laughs> he said, hi, how are you? I said, we're gonna have a great show. I play Salmonella and um, uh, it's gonna be great. And we do that show and then that was it. I left, did the Kenny Rogers show, my my career, whatever, started mm -hmm. until 2002 when the director of Tony Tina's Wedding decided we're, we're closing, we're gonna recast the show. And I was like, oh. <laughs> He goes, don't worry, you're going to still be in it. Don't worry. A couple of times. <laughs> okay, cool. But we have auditions again. And we're behind the table. And <clears throat> this girl walks in. And I go, she looks familiar. I don't know why. And she comes over. She goes, hi, my name is Jolie. I go, did you do the Godfather of Sugar Wedding? She's like, yeah. I said, I was, I was Sal Manelli, your first show. <laughs> oh, my God. But, uh, da, da, da. <laughs> but that was 98 when we first yeah. met. And her and I have been working together either in plays, Tony Tina's Wedding, short films, and TV series on YouTube. <laughs> and the Wanderer, I mean, it's like, what? How yeah. we're connected is like, it's so beautiful. She's one of my dearest, dearest, dearest friends. And uh, it's so fascinating how we have stayed working together this long. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Tony Tina's Wedding was... Uh, a great part of my life and uh i miss it a lot uh but it, it was it, it was great it was great it was great well i was gonna be really excited because i saw tony and tina's wedding in 1998 so when you said 98 i was like oh my god i probably saw you but no <laughs> did you see it downtown or it's yeah restaurant? yeah downtown? Yeah. That was before it moved to Sophia's restaurant okay when i got into it in 99 yeah, yeah. i so, thought in the spring of 2000 Mm. Oh, uh, so I'll, I'll have to check my program. Interesting. <laughs> oh, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> I want to know when uh, Jen, uh, you made Jen cry. That's really what, what we're not there, there yet, and we're when, gonna talk about what, it. What, 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 I want to get there now. Tell the story. You were on a you were on a game show, Johnny. You want to do you want to tell everyone what game show you were on? I was. <laughs> So right after, I did an off-Broadway show called A Room of My Own, uh, also written by Charles Messina, where Jolie Tribuzio played my wife. <laughs> and it was about his family in 1979, the week between Christmas and New Year's. And it was a wonderful show. Uh, we were very lucky to have Ralph Macchio play Charles as an adult <laughs> because it's a memory play. So Ralph is at a laptop typing out the mm -hmm. story and it comes mm -hmm. to life behind him, which was beautiful. Awesome. The set was absolutely amazing. And uh, we, we were lucky to have Mario Cantone play uh, my brother-in-law. Uh, he was absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. So we do this play for a month. It ends the day after. I'm like, <sighs> <laughs> oh, what do I do? So we're um, I'm hanging out, whatever. And my, 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 my former boss from Toys R Us Times Square texts me and he says, uh, the hundred thousand dollar pyramid is coming back. Michael Strahan is gonna be the host. Here's the link to apply. I think it would be a goof if you applied and get on. Wouldn't that be fun? And I'm like <laughs> Okay. Sure. So I about that night about two o'clock in the morning I couldn't sleep. I got up, I came to the computer and I go on the application. I start filling out the application. And we get to a part where it says, film a two-minute video of why you want to be on the pyramid. And I'm like, oh, now it's 2.45. I'm exhausted. My hair is all Italian term, scufats. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So I said, okay. And I said, I'll save it and do it tomorrow. And there's no save button to do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. So I hit record. And I ramble about how I used to watch the hunt. $25,000 pyramid. I used to watch the $10,000 pyramid and the $25,000 pyramid. <laughs> my mom and my grandmother. And uh, 
uh, I would get so nervous all the time. And I like look at my nails. I bit all my nails off. <laughs> and I told, I just rambled and rambled and rambled. Then I looked at the timer. I was like, oh, I'm past two minutes. Oh, no, I'm so sorry. And I clicked. <laughs> and then I submitted. Mm-hmm. Forgot about it. Now I'm unemployed. I had to go to the unemployment office. You know, it's that time of my life where I'm like, I'm a father and a husband and I'm unemployed, but I just did a wonderful off-Broadway show, but I'm unemployed. I'm mm-hmm. looking for my next job, but I'm unemployed. I'm excited, but I'm unemployed. So I'm like on this weird. So about four days later, I get a phone call from a 212 number. And unlike everybody else in the world, I answer every phone call. <laughs> <laughs> I just do. I don't know why. So I go, I go, hello. Hi. Um, is this Johnny? Yes. Hi. How are you? This is Melissa from uh, Pyramid Casting. Now I have no idea <laughs> what she means. When she says Pyramid Casting. I think for the first for two seconds, I think she's calling from a place that makes molds. <laughs> I swear to God. I'm like, Pyramid. I mean, oh yes. How are you? She says great. She goes. We watched your video. The producers loved it. She was like. But do you do anything else besides acting? Because they don't want actors on the show. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I did work at Toys R Us Times Square for 14 years. She goes, wait a minute. Didn't that just close? (laughs) Yeah. She goes, are you working now? I said, no. She goes, okay, we're going to go with that angle. Okay. She goes, what are you doing Thursday? Can you Skype? Oh, poor Skype. Um, (laughs) Can you Skype? And, and, and with the interview with the producers, I said, sure. So I did that Thursday. The next day, I went on again. We played the game. The next a week later, we did the game again. Um, then they said practice. They didn't tell me how to practice. They said <laughs> practice. So I was on my living room with the show on YouTube, standing by my TV, covering <laughs> answers with my arm and trying to guess before they guess. My wife was like, what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know what to do. I to they told me to practice. They told me to practice. I don't know how to practice. I'm going to practice. So she said, um, See, do they have a game? I went, oh. So I found the DVD game online. Mm-hmm. And it was like, this, this is how... The, the, how crazy life is and my, how crazy i am i go oh it's 35 dollars <laughs> so i really want to spend 35 i mean i'm not cheap but i'm frugal and i want to I said, I said, idiot if you don't spend this 35 dollars and then you lose what happens you want to say what if you win i'm like oh, whatever so we buy it and then my uh, my mother and my my wife and my son Help me play the game. <laughs> so I would sit on the couch. My wife would sit on the coffee table with the DVD remote. No, I'm sorry. My wife's on the couch. I'm on the coffee table. It's me because I have the answers. So my wife would hit the, hit the DVD remote and she'd do it and we'd play the game. And I got really good. But I always was good at this game because I love this game. Because mm-hmm. you can say anything without saying a rhyme or the yeah. word. So you can <laughs> and you could do anything. So it's a great <laughs> So my mother came over. She would help me. Um, a funny story my wife tells is uh, when I was giving her the clues, <laughs> uh, I, see the, I see the answer, and I'm like, okay. so I give her these three clues. I give her basketball, an Oreo cookie, and a dry clown. And she goes, What? <laughs> a basketball, an Oreo cookie, and a dry clown. And she's like, what the hell are you talking about? I said, things you dunk. Yeah. <laughs> and she says, if you do that on that television, I'm going to kill you. Because I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you, I did get the phone call that I was going to be on. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I skip that part. <laughs> so we're practicing, 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 practicing. We get to the day. It's April 15th, uh, 2016. And it's in the studio on 66th ABC Studios. 
and I'm nervous, like a performer. I'm nervous. My heart is racing. I got to go to the bathroom. I hope everything. So I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Uh, and then this guy with uh, an old, uh, older guy, older gentleman with a baseball cap on. He comes in. He's like, hi. Um, uh, what the heck was his name? Stewart. Uh, anyway, Stewart. Whatever. He says, I'm, I'm here to help you win the money. Everybody's like, yay! <laughs> he calls us in one by one, and they come back, and then he calls my name. We go inside, and we go into a room, and he goes, "Um, all right, Johnny, we're going to play the game. I'm going to help you win this money. So, okay. So we play the game back and forth. He goes, that, and remember, you, you can't rhyme, and you can't say the word. That's the only thing you can't do in this room. And I'm like, okay, thank you. That's good to know. And we do it again. He goes, great, great, great. Okay, let's go to the winner's circle. All right. So I'm, you're going to give the clues. And they're going to give the answers. Okay. So, and we're going to and back and forth, back and forth. Remember, you can't do this. You can't do this. Okay, great, 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 great. We go to the game. We're filming the game. And, oh, my gosh, I don't know. The powers that be were with me. I was doing really well. Really mm -hmm. well. Really well. You can watch it on YouTube. You <laughs> also on Hulu. Uh, season one, episode five. Um, so, nice. Uh, so, um, uh, we do the game. And I'm, I get to the winner's circle. And I'm like, oh. Oh my God, I'm going it. You, this show was very close to me because my grandmother mm -hmm. and I watched it. It was mm -hmm. like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm in the winter. Nostalgic circle. show. I mean, oh come my on. God. Nostalgia. Hello. <laughs> so I get to the winter circle and I'm like, wow. And Anna Camp, beautiful young yeah. actress, she's wonderful. She's, I'm giving her the clues. And the first thing flips and I get it. And the second thing flips and it was things that are salty. So I said, Instead of saying beach water, I said water at the beach. And you can't say at the. You just got to give mm. lists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they went, eh, eh. I went, oh. <laughs> and that, the eh, eh got me all discombobulated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I get all messed up for the rest of it. It didn't happen. So come, we, go to the, we go to the game again. I do really well again. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I got to the winner's circle again. <laughs> <laughs> what? But because I went for the 50, now because you get to the winner's circle again, you go for the 100,000. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, my Lord in heaven. I'm unemployed. Uh, this $100,000 will come in very nicely into my family. <laughs> mm -hmm. handy. So we sit down. It's me and Randall Park, who's great. Mm -hmm. And... Commercial. During the commercial break, thousands of what felt like thousands of people surround us. <laughs> hair is doing my hair, the makeup is patting him and patting him. And then here's the guy. It's not Stuart, it was Sandy. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sandy comes walking over to me and looks me right in my eyes. He goes, Hey Johnny, how you doing? I'm like, fine, Sandy. He goes, do you know what you did wrong the first time? <laughs> yes. He goes, are you going to do that again? I go, no. He goes, oh, let's win this money. It's almost five o'clock and all the union guys got to go home. I said, okay. <laughs> the people start to leave. We're about to come back from commercial. I look at Randall Park. I said, Randall, I said, I know they said I used to work at a toy store and I'm unemployed. But I do what you do. I'm an actor, performer, sketch comedy, improv, the whole nine yards. So pay attention to me. And he, went, <laughs> he looked at me and went, you got it. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So we're standing there, we're sitting on my hands, and we go. And I got the first one really quick. I got the second one. I had a little trouble with the second one because it said what a diving board would say. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. thought it said surfboard. And I start saying I'm in the water and you stand on me and I'm working in the rat. I went, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> no I'm at the top of an Olympic sized pool and you climb up to me and you jump. And, go, and then we get to, and we get to the top one and we have a lot of seconds left. And when it flips, I see it and I go, uh, a match. And he says, things you strike. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, what? How did you get? Because the next thing out of my mouth was going to be bowling pins mm -hmm. and a picket line. Right. And I didn't know if I would get to those things. And when he said things you strike, I was like, what? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So I tell my wife all the time, I'm a good clue giver. <laughs> Even though you couldn't get dry clown, he got you to strike for me saying one word. Because he said to me, he goes, I pictured you when you said things, you, uh, a match. I pictured uh -huh. you getting up, pulling a match book out of your pocket and going like this. The way you mm -hmm. said a match. I was right. like, wow. 
So go. all in all, I won one hundred and four thousand five hundred dollars. Amazing. Um, I got the check in the mail that August, the whole thing. Mm. And I had to pay the taxes on it, which helped me until I found whatever other job uh, again. Um, and, uh, you know, bought some fun things here and there and stuff like that. But uh, that was a, an amazing experience because I loved game shows growing up. But I never thought I'd be on a game show, let alone win. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was uh, it was an amazing experience. It was great. It was great. And you made Jen cry. I'm sorry. And I cried. So uh, to your point of you cry at commercials, I cry at commercials, I cry at game shows, I cry, sometimes I cry at award shows, but uh, we're not going to talk about that the morning after the Oscars. Um, sometimes <laughs> <laughs> cry at many things. But um, I remember Frank telling me, I, I watched it back again to like refresh my memory on YouTube. <laughs> I found it. Um, yeah. And I remember like, as soon as I saw you, I was like, Oh no, we totally watch this in real time. And I remember Frank telling me that he knew you. So then there's like this extra layer of like, Oh, there's like one degree separating us. So now I'm more invested. So now I'm probably crying even more. So <laughs> rewatching it. I got the, I got the willed eyes again. I was like, here we go. This is what happens. And, so and that I, is how you made me cry. Uh, I'm sorry, but I love it. <laughs> I, love, I love the reason why I do what I do is I love to evoke emotion mm -hmm. out of people, whether it's sad, happy, nervous, whatever the feels that people get that I, I love. I love feeling and I love giving uh, and, and making feelings happen. So I'm sorry. Well, I you, but... it's, it's, uh, it's okay. I mean, it wasn't the only time too, because you did, you did a little bit of a speech when with the end of the Toys R Us run. <clears throat> I did. I did. Um, I think you got me with one word on that, by the way. You know, that's, <laughs> that's a crazy story because the morning of my friend Mary, my work wife at Toys R Us, she was like, are you doing the rally this morning? Because I would do the rally every morning. I said, mm -hmm. yeah. She goes, what are you going to say? I'm like, I don't know. I've been thinking about this all morning. I have no idea what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. She was like, well, you got to think about you got to talk about how long it's been. You have to talk about what people uh, experience when they come in here and what the workers experience with people coming in here, the tourists, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, I have an idea. So I went on my phone and I figured out how many seconds, how many minutes, how many hours, how many days, how many months was 14 years. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it all down. And I'm like, now oh, what am I going to say? I said, oh. Top 10 things I'm not going to uh, uh, miss. Okay. So I wrote them down. But then I was like, to just to pull out this piece of paper that's this big, it's not Johnny Tamaro-ish. Yeah. <laughs> I got to do something else. So I got all these. I got a huge printer paper. I taped it all together. I made a scroll. I put it in my pocket. And I'm like, what is the one thing I am going to miss? If I'm, gonna, if I'm not going to miss these 10 things... What's the one thing I'm, I am going to miss? I'm going to miss coming here. I'm going to miss the people. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote down that word and I mm -hmm. put it in my wallet. I said, oh, my God, either this is going to go over okay <laughs> or it's going to go over really well. Mm -hmm. right? So I get there and, and uh, I grab my piece of paper and I say, uh, 800,000, blah, 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 down and I go, that's exactly 14 years in seconds, minutes, whatever, whatever. And then I say what I have to say, and I said, Here are things I will not miss. <clears throat> and I opened the, the scroll and they laughed. And I said, Top 10 things I will not miss. And I went through all of them. Which, by the way, if you've worked in customer service or any kind of uh, experiential marketing, whatever, you can relate to every single thing on that list. <laughs> <laughs> And all of it was true. Yeah. It was, it was everything, we, everything, everything. And then I said, that was a thing of list that I will not miss. And here is uh, things I will miss. And I went in my pocket and pulled out my wallet and pulled out this little piece of paper, unfolded mm -hmm. it, it was about this big. And I said, to know what I said, you can go on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> go to the Funkland. Yes. The, the Funkland guy oh, yeah. on Facebook. Yeah. He goes, hi, I don't know. Uh, my name is uh, um, Kevin. Da -da 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 -funk. I was like, I know who you are. Of course I know who you are. 
and he called me. We had a wonderful conversation. And he goes, is it okay if we put that in the video? I said, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I said you, everybody lost it. They yeah. lost it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my God. So we opened the store. Mm -hmm. Okay. Four hours later, one of the security guards comes over. He goes, Johnny, somebody put that video on Facebook. And 5,000 views already. I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> By the end of the day, it was up to 200,000 views. Oh I'm like, God. what? The next day, it was 400,000 views. And on Facebook, I think it got to 650,000 views. But now on on Defunct Land, I think he's up to like 1.2 million views. Oh, yeah. Or whatever. yeah. Uh, but, you know, that was uh, that place, Toys R Us Times Square. I worked there from the moment it opened. Mm -hmm. Until the moment it closed, and it was the biggest toy store in the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. and I was a very intricate part of that experience. And you know, I did the tours in the morning before the store opened. Uh, I was a character called Vinny in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. I became one of the department supervisors, I became a manager, I became an HR supervisor. I hired most of the people there, I interviewed them. I Gave them orientation. Right. It was the job that I juggled with Tony and Tina's wedding mm -hmm. for ten years, and um, that job, that that place was wonderful. And when we, when they told us we were closing, September twentieth, twenty fifteen, they said we're going to close the store. We were all like, "Oh my god!" Yeah. And then we said the last day is December thirtieth, and I said, "Okay." I, I raised my hand. They were like, "What's the matter?" I go. Um, can I be the one that lets the last person out and locks the door? <laughs> and they said, okay. And that's what I did, which was, that was pretty cool. But you would you have always, to, as the nostalgic okay. person you are, you would have Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you got to have that moment. <laughs> it's have, like yeah. changing, the, changing the letters on the Santa Land marquee at Macy's. That's oh, that. <laughs> that my thing. Uh, yes. You when I can shut moment. it down and change it till Santa will return in November, I was like, oh. yes, this is it right here. I love it. I love it. I, love it. <laughs> I, uh, I know that we have kept you over the hour that we said. Okay. However, <laughs> however, you guys have only hinted at how you know each other. You have not said how you know each other, though. So I think that needs to be told. It's, Johnny, um, your first year at Macy Santa Land was two, 2010? Uh, 2010. Yeah, so Johnny's first year was my final year. Mm, okay. yeah. And I don't think I I don't think I was the one that interviewed you. Did I interview or no? No, uh GW yeah. and Kate. Mm -hmm. Kate and GW. I had a little uh little beard here going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I walked in. I was I was working at Toys R Us and I walked in for the interview and I sit down. And uh, GW says, uh, why do you like Christmas? <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> I went, do you have time? <laughs> so I just tell him mm -hmm. everything about my mm -hmm. family and nostalgia and Christmas and what it means. And, blah, 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 da, 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 da. and Kate asked me questions. Da, 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 da. And then Christopher, I think, came in mm -hmm. and he asked me some questions. Ugh. Christopher just uh, passed away last oh, month, and he was he was he was the guy running the room where Johnny was, and he just Ooh. knew how to work that room, uh, oh, yeah. you know, and, and get all the guys in that room amped up for the season. I was very uh, usually in the in the in the elf room, as it were. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say Johnny and I interacted too much, but enough to know that you know, enough to know yeah. enough to know. Yeah. And then uh, there was a new HR person that year. Mm -hmm. And there was a mix-up because some right. of the guys didn't get called back. Right. Who have been there for a lot of years, like two or three guys. Yeah. And when I got the phone call, I was like, because what had happened was since I'm born, my mother would get on the end train, which is right behind my house. The train mm -hmm. ran right below my backyard. We'd get on the end train. We'd get to 34th Street. We'd go up the wooden escalators. I'd see the beautiful Santa land, whether it was the train or the, 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 the houses, um, like the village and we go see Santa Claus. <laughs> I have all the pictures from one year from before I was one until teenage years. I mean, it mm -hmm. was, it was the place that we went to, to, to really feel and begin to feel that Christmas holiday spirit, which is very important to me. So when my when all of our ch children were born, we started to make that 
Trek as well. And here we are on t- in 2009. We go to see Santa Claus and we get to the entrance of the of the house at the village. And there's an elf. And she says, hi, my name is Fritz. How many in your party? Yes. And I go, Julia. Oh, my God. <laughs> and she goes, my name is Spritz. And I'm like, oh, sorry. Hey, hi, Spritz. <laughs> Turns out Julia worked with me at Toys R Us Times Square as a demonstrator, product demonstrator. Hmm. So the next day I see her at work. And she says, I was like, oh, my God, how long have you been working there? She goes, oh, you would be great working with us. You're <laughs> I'm like, I was like, I, I got to be, be 40 years old in, 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 in two years. I don't want to be an elf. She goes, no, not an elf. <laughs> what? I'm like, no. She goes, when the applications come out next year in the summer, I'm going to forward it to you. And you put my name <laughs> and, and, and you'll have an interview and we'll see. <laughs> so, okay. And I did. And uh, the story, you know, I don't want to go too much into the story. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of them. <laughs> I got a lot of them. But the original story of me sitting at this desk right now applying and my wife in the kitchen saying, what are you doing? <laughs> and, uh I'm applying to Macy's to be uh, <laughs> good luck with that. And <laughs> in my mind, I had this whole scenario that my family, we were going to make the appointment. We were going to have the meeting on Thanksgiving like we mm-hmm. always do. Mm-hmm. What day are we going? We're going to go this day. <laughs> I'm going to not show up because I'm stuck at work. And they're going to come and they're going to go see Santa Claus. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah. it's going to be a magical moment, like a miracle on 34th. <laughs> and it's going to be blow their minds. And that's what's in my head. And that's exactly what happens. Oh, man. And it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> so that's how Frank and I know each other. Mm-hmm. Fun fact, Spritz, one of the two elves in my living room here when... Mrs. Dillo and I got engaged. That's right. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. That's beautiful. That's <laughs> Yeah, and, and Macy's, you know, I've been there this whole time since 2010, and it's one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the, you know, for the most part, you know, they come in and it's, you know, I want this, I want this, I want this. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of moments where it's just like, mm-hmm. a lot of people opening up when they do the, yeah. when they visit. It's unreal. Mm-hmm. I mean, not to go much too much into it, but I remember this older, these two older ladies walk in and one sits on my right, one sits on my left. And this one says, we just celebrated our 80, I just celebrated my 82nd birthday. This is my daughter. She's 60. We've been coming to see you for 60 years. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and she's got tears in her eyes. Mm-hmm. And she has tears in her eyes. And I say, it's okay. I still see the little girl in both of you. And we're all <laughs> crying. Everybody's crying. <laughs> what is going on here? You know, there are moments. It's so... You know, mm-hmm. people say, last year, I, I, I asked you to take my cancer away. Mm. And then they come back and they say, I'm cancer free. And it's like, what is what is this? Yeah. What is this? Because it's very important, very important to mm-hmm. most people. The emotion is so real. That's the thing. It's yeah. not a put on emotion. It's mm-hmm. not... It's, it's not people are ex- faking to be excited or faking to be, you know, sad or faking to be. It's real mm-hmm. because you're on this maze and you, once you get to see and you walk in and you see that he's there and you're like, oh, you become eight years old again. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It. And it's just like, what? And it's 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 amazing. 
Yeah. No, it's a. I, I, I'm. I don't want to say it's an exercise, but it, it, it's an exercise in uh, the power of connection and experience combined. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's really unlike because because you're directly, you know, you're having a conversation. You know, we talk yeah. about Disney character meet and greet. Sometimes people hugging Mickey Mouse and people go, you know, but here you're talking and you're expressing your feelings and you're talking about wishes and you never mm -hmm. and you never know what people are gonna say. Mm -hmm. you know? You know, you have a lot of different people, a lot of different experiences. And uh, sometimes it's like, hold, hold it. <laughs> I got to compose myself. Give me the tissue, you know. So, um, But I always know when it's the 24th of every month because Johnny will post how many months it is until, quote, the greatest night of the year. <laughs> the greatest night of the year. It's Christmas Eve to me because, yeah. you know. In a big Italian family, we have the seven fishes and it's mm -hmm. the whole family around. And then Christmas Day, the, the three boys in my family spend it with each of their families. But Christmas Eve is the thing. Um, but you know what? I was talking to my wife. Uh, you know, okay, way to bring it down, Johnny. Men <laughs> Mental health is a very, very important, serious thing that... Mm -hmm. you know, now we're looking at it and not too many people talk about it, but now more and more and more people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. So um, since we, well, when we decided we were going to sell my childhood home that my great grandfather bought, mm -hmm. I went, something happened and I went into a, I think it was a depression and it manifested in very weird ways. And this Christmas that just passed, I wasn't feeling it as I usually feel it. Mm -hmm. And then I said to myself, maybe it's because I put too much emphasis throughout the whole year on it. So I decided with my wife and she loved that. I decided this. <laughs> I decided to not put that much crazy emphasis throughout the year on Christmas, because once I get to this massive holiday, the day after I'm in a funk, mm -hmm. I'm in a, I'm in a hole for like a, a month and I don't want, I don't, I don't want that to happen anymore. So yes, I do love Christmas. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. But you're probably not going to see that many posts throughout the year about it. I have an important <laughs> question about Christmas Eve though. Do you think it has a smell? <laughs> <laughs> a smell? Mm -hmm. When you step outside on Christmas Eve <laughs> in the early evening, is smell. there a smell in the air? It does have a smell. It does. It does. Yeah. And I don't know how to describe it. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like a, um, a, a wispy uh, coldness. Yes. Um, I don't know how to describe it. Mixed with a little bit of fireplace smell. Yes, like, yes. A, like a burnt mm -hmm. uh, wood. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Yeah. It does. Oh, I never thought about that. <laughs> now, now we're giving you something to look forward to. Wow, I can't wait. Because we're seeing it, we're like, what is that smell? Jen is right. <laughs> Jen is right. <laughs> That is, uh, yeah, and 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 just to, just to say, we agree, Christmas Eve is uh, is yes is much bigger to us than Christmas Day, which is why right. I I bring it up. But uh, also to say, you know, we talk about dillowing our expectations a lot, where we Love we it. don't want to we don't want to put too much on it. We gotta we gotta bring it down so that you gotta, it's okay. You gotta dillow it. You gotta yeah. dillow it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, yes. You know, it's uh, being. And at this at this age now, I just I turned fifty in July, and at this age, looking back and 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 trying to figure it, still trying to figure it all out, you know, mm -hmm. and still learning, and still with everything in my life, it's like I try my best to like just take a step back, take a breath, and and I found meditation right before the pandemic, mm -hmm. right before we were quarantined. My wife said, "I think you need to start." meditating because we just sold the house and I was in this crazy funk yeah and went to therapy and all this stuff and wow there's there's a lot of people gonna watch this that are gonna find out a lot about me <laughs> <clears throat> so I went to therapy and then my wife for Christmas got me a meditation to go to to transcendental meditation oh and nice I mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. and I did that and it saved my life that so what saved my life during the quarantine which is funny 
transcendental meditation, uh, listening to Christmas music. Mm. I, every morning as I'm making breakfast for my son, <laughs> I have, and he'd come in in the, in the kitchen and be like, oh, <laughs> really? I'm like, yeah, really? Leave me alone. It's helping me. And then um, the writer of The Wanderer and the mm-hmm. producer of The Wanderer calls me up and says, uh, we got to do something during quarantine. We have to keep the juices flowing. We have mm-hmm. to keep the mm-hmm. creative thing going. I said, okay, what are we going to do? He goes, we're going to do a TV show. <laughs> and we're going to put it on YouTube. It's going to start you and Jolie. And mm-hmm. you're going to be brother and sister. It's going to be called the Honey Zoomers. <laughs> and it's going to be like, Arch, it's going to be like all in the family, the odd couple and the honeymooners all in one. I said, Charles, we're going to quarantine. How are we going to film a TV show? I can't be in the same room with her. There are rules. <laughs> You're going to film your scenes and lines in your apartment, and she's going to film her scenes and her lines in her apartment, and she's going to edit everything together. Did you like this segue? And she's going to edit everything <laughs> together, and you're gonna, we're going to put it on YouTube. And I'm like, okay. Mm-hmm. And that also saved me during the quarantine. Yeah. yeah. And that was an amazing experience too, because setting up camera angles, setting up my light, what I'm going to wear, <laughs> what, mm-hmm. what props, having right. my lines every week, a different script. And I'm like, Jesus, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the way she edited it, it looks like we're in the same place. And every episode had something to do with the pandemic. So it's the first sitcom about the pandemic filmed during the pandemic and then we got all all these news channels and in the newspaper and Joyce Randolph the original Trixie from the honeymoon gave us the stamp of approval and I'm like this is nuts so that was great too during the quarantine that was fun in your in your business in your life Johnny I feel like you know the ability to pivot is key and you know and and the connections you make are key and especially the one you have with Charles Messina clearly has carried you now to what you've been waiting to get up at Paper Mill for two years with The yeah. Wanderer. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's through April 24th. Is it, it, What else uh, can we possibly add that right now? If you were to give me a hard sell, Johnny, if you're going to sell me hard, <laughs> you don't have to sell me hard, you know, because I want to go. I just got to find it in my schedule. So <laughs> I try to try to get out of work. It's fine. But if you give me a hard sell, Johnny, I'll give you a couple minutes here to think about it. So they're, you know, they have this uh, this term called jukebox musical. Mm-hmm. And you've seen them throughout the years. And there's a lot of people when they heard this was coming out that uh, this is a jukebox musical. But we don't call it that. We call it a real life musical. And this is about a man who was an Italian kid from the Bronx, where at 15, 16 years old, his father brought him to record producers, possibly at the Brill Building. And he played his guitar and sang a song and got in. You know, he says to himself, how did an Italian kid from the Bronx get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Mm -hmm. And they tried to to, to mold him to be Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin. And Jimmy Roselli, and he said, no, I'm a rock and roller. I play guitar. To come see this show, the perseverance, the redemption, like I said before, the, the, the wanting to do it your way, but not only selfishly, mm-hmm. but try to grab everybody in your life that is trying to tell you to do it this way and convince them and say and get them on board with you. That's what happens in the show to do it your way. And when you come see the show, you are going to experience a whirlwind of emotions. You're going to laugh. You're going to cry. You're going to be like, oh, you're going to be on the edge of your seat. You're going to love the music. You're going to love the acting, the costumes that that the costume designer, Sarah Lux, what she was able to bring in. Some of them are made specifically for the show. But like my costumes and Jolie's costumes are vintage costumes from the 1950s. Mm -hmm. We look like we're in a movie. (laughs) Um, The set is like a character in itself. What the set looks like and what it does is it blows my mind every night. And when you and at the end of the show where you you'll feel for him and everybody has something that Dion had going on up here through the show. 
what, whatever addiction it is, it, it could be an addiction. It could just be a nervousness. It could just be, you don't like to go out, whatever it is inside. Mm -hmm. Most of us have something and you're going to feel that when you see the show. And, at, and, and by the end of the show, you'll see how someone would, it was able to deal with that. And maybe it will help you deal with what you're going through as well. I love it. it and just, again, I think the pers perseverance is really something mm -hmm. that everyone is uh, is looking for these days. Yeah. So yeah. it's a really exciting time for you, Johnny. You're so excited because, again, you know, all the things you've done. I, I like I look at everything you've done the past 20, 25 years and just how much of it is about experience and connection and your own your own ability. And, you know, we, we could say audience in terms of theater terms, but you're always in interacting with audience yeah. in all yeah. of, in all of these roles even customer service you know yeah, oh, yeah. Us, Times square that was an audience that came to mm -hmm. a tourist attraction as much as it was about retail uh, you know you know and and to see it to see it now play out in, in here in, in this form and I'm glad you said jukebox musical because in my head I'm like don't say jukebox musical because ju <laughs> you can you. feel the difference you can feel that it's oh, not like well, yeah you, you know, people hear jukebox musical and they just kind of write it off a different way. And so I'm glad you phrased it that way because yeah. I was like, don't say that because it has a negative connotation that doesn't, that we don't need it's, to talk about. Yeah, they call it, they, we call it the real life musical. And when you see the yeah. show, you'll know, you'll see the, the way Charles Messina wrote it. All of the, the scenes go nicely into the song. It makes sense where the song is. And mm -hmm. when it comes out of the song, it continues and makes sense. It wasn't just right. like, it's a dance song. <laughs> it's another right. dance song. Blam. It's right. like, ah. So, and the story is, the book is great. The, mm -hmm. the, the writing is so real. The writing is truthful. The writing mm -hmm. is New York. The writing is, like Dion says, he's a rhythm singer. And Charles is a rhythm writer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He knows how to write for us. Right. And, 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 and speaking about connections, um, the other a couple of months ago, I'm sitting down and I'm thinking about my very first audition on the island of Manhattan. And that was for the Kenny Rogers show. Right. Mm -hmm. And I can track back every single thing that I've been cast in and I've gotten paid for professionally mm -hmm. to that one audition for the mm -hmm. Kenny Rogers show. It all tracks back to that one audition. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy because of connections and, you know, my wife is like, it's the type of person that you are. Mm -hmm. she says, That's the reason why so many people are coming to see you in this show. Mm -hmm. I have a calendar at, at, in the dressing room with all names on almost <laughs> every day. And my, my roommate, uh, Jeffrey Schechter, who we call Shecky, he's like, what is that? I was like, these are all the people that have come to see me in the show. He's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, I, I, I guess I know a lot of people. My wife is like, no, she said, people know your story. People know mm -hmm. what you've been doing your whole right. life and what you've been trying to get to. And everybody likes a winner, she said. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I guess I, I don't know if I'm a winner, but I guess I'm I like I, I never gave up. I, mean, I don't know where this show is going to go, what's going to mm -hmm. happen with it. But where it is now is a pretty cool spot. Mm -hmm. And I never gave up to get to this spot. I still had a regular job, but I still performed. I never stopped performing. I could not not perform. I had to perform. It's something mm -hmm. that I have to do. And, you know, I have a lot of friends that went to a regular job and stopped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, 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 to keep going and keep going. And, and like I said, perseverance. You know, when you look in the dictionary, if under perseverance, you see my face. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it's so gratifying and I don't take it for granted at all. Mm -hmm. So many people in this business that are jaded and they're so young. And I look at them, I go, I'm 50 years old and I still love the guy that pulls the rope to fly <laughs> and, in. Mm -hmm. and I still look at the mic guy and go, how does this mic go on? Oh, it's, and I got to take, oh my God, look at this. <laughs> I revel and, and I am in awe about every single piece of it. And to be that way at this age is, I, you know, people say that it's, it's not, it's odd. It's not the norm, mm -hmm. but I'm, I, I come from, you know, I say this all the time and I'm proud of it. I come from community theater, you know, and community is one thing that this show is really about right. where 
this kid from the Bronx went out and he came back. He would always go back to the Bronx and they would in 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 the beginning they wouldn't because of 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 the the heroin uh, addiction that he had and they mm-hmm. would look down at him and say oh it is that that drug addict but then that you know mm-hmm. he found God again and he got into AA and 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 all that mm-hmm. he found himself again and then he goes back to the Bronx and they embrace him the mm-hmm. community surrounds him and that's what I feel is happening to me with all these people coming to the show. Right. It's like I have people at the show from people from my kindergarten class <laughs> all the way to the guy I met yesterday at the bodega and everybody in between. Mm-hmm. And it blows my mind. Yeah. And my wife is like, it's because it's the type of person that you are. Everybody, mm-hmm. you know, you, you and my father used to say. My father used to say all the time, just be nice. Just be nice. Mm-hmm. Just be nice. And that's what I do. I'm nice. I'm nice to everybody. Mm-hmm. And 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 that comes back. When you're nice, it comes back to 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 tenfold and it and it and it supports you and lifts you and just brings you forward in whatever you're doing, whatever it is, performing, whatever job, whatever whatever part of your life it is, just be nice and do what you have to do. <clears throat> well, Johnny, I said I wasn't going to make you emotional, <laughs> but now we have to end the podcast. You lied. <laughs> <laughs> well, Johnny, thanks so much for taking this time with us. Absolutely tremendous. I knew you'd have, I mean, pleasure. you know, all, all everything that you shared is is and amazing and we're so excited for uh, the run of the Wanderer here at the Paper Mill thanks. Playhouse through April 24th and then what will happen next? It is inevitable. <laughs> you know th- this Broadway thing, and, <laughs> and that that would be, you know, the ultimate because mm-hmm. doing shows that have been on Broadway from five years old, looking at it, and the fact that it's this close to doing <laughs> that. Every morning I wake up and it's like, wow, this is this could happen. What the heck? So it's it's very uh, it's it's scary and exciting and nerve wracking and, and and overwhelming all at the same time. But it's all good. It's all good. And if you can come and see the Wanderer, I know the tickets are selling fast. But if you're able to, uh, you can go to papermill.org or you can go to the wanderermusical.com and you can click the link for tickets or my Instagram at Johnny Tamaro Seven Eleven. You can click the link in my bio for tickets, but it's a great show. And so far we've only done four shows and everybody's saying, I have to bring my wife back. I have to see it again. I can't wait. This is amazing. People are crying. I had my friend, this Italian guy from Germany, you know, big guy. I'm a man. Guy, he, I, I, he's, he's crying. He hugged me. He was crying. He was like, oh my God, Johnny, this is amazing. You, what, what happened on that stage? I can't even describe it. So You'll feel it. You'll feel all the feels. Mm-hmm. You'll laugh, cry. You'll love it. If you get a chance to come see it, come check it out. Johnny, again, thanks so much. Obviously, the greatest of luck with everything. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll talk to you again sometime. Yes, every, anytime. This is a pleasure, Frank. And Jen, <laughs> fabulous. I loved it. I loved it. Kisses. Go to DillosDiz.com for blogs, vlogs, and more. DillosDiz.com. Follow DillosDiz on Twitter, on Instagram, and on TikTok at the DillosDiz. Dillos with an S, Diz with a Z. You can like DillosDiz on Facebook, Facebook.com slash DillosDiz. And you can subscribe to DillosDiz on YouTube, YouTube.com slash DillosDiz. It is on that channel that you will find theme park. Park Thursday Live each and every Thursday morning, youtube.com slash Dillos Diz. Then head over to DillosDizResort.com, your escape to Disney nostalgia. DillosDizResort.com, Patreon membership levels beginning as low as $1 per month. DillosDizResort.com.
Theme Park Thursday with Dillo's Diz featuring Frank Cardillo and Jen Cardillo Snyder. The theme was composed by Matt Harvey. The intro and the outro was performed by Lindsay Zerugian. The Dillo's Diz fact checker is Mel Dale. Until next week, we'll see you real soon for Theme Park Thursday with Dillo's Diz. The Improviser's Guide Network 2022.